Good day, my name is John Bennett from the Canberra School of Mines and uh, I've been a member of the Quarries National Joint Advisory Committee for some 14 years now and I've uh, seen a lot of good guidance and work done in that time uh, but we, like everybody else in the industry, the QNJAC people are concerned that the progress on target zero has not been as we would have liked it lately uh, and so we've had a lot of discussions and considerations of how to address this and one thing that came out of this was that I was asked to undertake an initiative looking at leading indicators for the industry. So if we think of trailing indicators as the injuries that we count, the um, lost time frequency rate, putting it against person hours or indeed at a longer time scale industrial diseases and of course compensation claims which focus the corporate mind but how do we get ahead of this? We get into the prevention of these things. So I brought together a team of respected health and safety managers from a number of our Korean companies to see what we could come up with. And with the um, kind hospitality of the EPC explosives company and their contribution as well, we had a good day's meeting and came up with 12 areas, refined it to 12, where we felt we could count useful things and therefore measure and hopefully manage things better. This was obviously a very quantitative exercise. So we've also produced a very short one page uh, questionnaire or survey for employees perceptions that also adds into this. So if we just look at a simple process diagram, inputs and outputs and something that happens in between, and we have the desirable outputs, but also these unwanted outputs of injuries or ill health, and it's really what can we do in the ways of working, the things that people are doing that we can control. These are the 12 areas. Um, I won't dwell on them now because I'll go through them one by one, but um, I was only to say that leadership naturally came up at the top and the first one, but I'm going to leave it till last for presentational reasons here. So move on into hazard and near miss reporting. If you um, put into a search engine health safety leading indicators, you will come up with numerous consultants and academics that will tell you the very first one normally they say is count your near misses. Um, so do you have a procedure in place? Is the company doing something in this regard? Uh, is it simple and straightforward to use and actively encouraged by managers and supervisors? And is there always a follow up? Is there a good procedure for letting people know the outcomes? And this is just a, something that I observed a while ago using little report cards. Everybody has a few in their overall pocket and they can write down the date, the time, the location on site and a, a description of what they've seen. And then a whiteboard for reporting back. But there's many other ways, possibly even um, applications on phones these days, something like that. And now these are the indicators that we came up with um, and uh, the green slides will show our actual countable indicators. So basically number of reports per head, but we do need to be uh, careful about this. Does a low number of reports necessarily mean a safe quarry or is it a question of um, the procedure having fallen out of repute? Uh, perhaps people haven't been getting feedback, perhaps it hasn't been well publicized, um, it's getting a bit stale. Um, so really you need to be confident that your, uh, your procedure is working well and is being owned by people. And if you are, then obviously you'd be looking for reducing trend of near miss uh, events or um, lurking hazards people are coming up with. You can also measure the time to close these things out and give people feedback on what you've done about it. And then you can have planned, you don't have to wait for people to come up with these things by chance. You can have actual planned site walkabouts to bring these things in. And of course, since we produced the guidance on this, which I'll tell you about later, um, the ISO 45001 safety standard has come out. And so I'm going to try and link a little bit here. And there is a section on hazard identification which fits very well with this. Just to say that I've worked with a lot of standards over the years. And it's really important to have a well working procedure and fit that into the standard rather than scrap everything and start again with the standard. You will have a, a much better result. Moving on then to a more of a cultural one here, empowerment to stop the job. And we, we feel that um, nowadays 
there's a far, far fewer people on a site. People are using highly technical machines, and there's probably more skilled than their supervisors in in many regards. Um, and so, people have to have leadership in a sense. Everyone on the site, and if they see something that's going on that they believe is to be unsafe, they must have the the confidence to stop that. Now they'll only have that if there's a stated company policy and they're getting constantly told by their management that this is what's expected of them. So is this a communicated policy? Do people have uh, this uh, information given to them? So indicators then, the green one, is an actual number of incidents that people are reporting, you can measure that, and the number of outgoing communication events such as mentions in team meetings or toolbox talks and this is our first um, survey question here or statement really that we rate one to ten and do make sure people understand which is the one and which is the ten the positive is the ten i could stop a job myself and receive backing from the management if i consider it to be unsafe backing from the management that's the important bit there i think Moving on, competence. Well, it's something we've been working with for a long time with the QNJC and the industry, and this the MPQC company, of course. So, are all jobs, no matter how humble, assessed for their competence requirements? And there are, of course, national standards now. Um, and does every employee in your company receive a regular appraisal, at least annual, and that sets against their experience and further development is considered, which not necessarily have to be training courses, it could be putting other people together with them, it could be something on safety and health, some developmental thing, a refresher training or something just to stimulate them. And is this then provided in a timely manner? So basically your indicators then, we could say percentage of jobs that have been fully assessed for competence requirements. It used to be called training needs analysis, but it's a bit wider than just training courses. And then the time scale to provide the things that have been promised to people, which can be a cause of contention. So in our survey then, we have a statement, the company always provides me in good time with the support and training that I need to do my job safely and well, in good time can be the one that raises things. And there is a whole section in the ISO standard on competence that this fits very well with. Communication, a basic human activity. And our team discussed this and we're very keen on clear, simple communications. Look for simple means of illustrating things. It's always should, of course, be two way. Plenty of listening, not just talking, and indeed responding and following up. Flowcharts, a very useful way of um, simply explaining procedures, provided they do not get too complicated in themselves, and there's an art to that. The use of memorable stories and describing incidents in order to explain why good procedure is important. And there are certain things that have to be communicated, of course, such as reviews of risk assessments and outcomes of incident investigations. Good participation in safety committees. Now, uh, site managers who believe in safety committees and safety reps can find them an extremely useful tool, um, but it has to be considered as part and parcel of the way that these things are done around there. Um, members of the workforce uh, can usefully uh, study and present topics themselves within a team meeting, supported, of course, by their supervisor. I've always found that a very powerful thing. It develops people and more may offer to do it. Where there's a particular message to get across, and I, I believe there's currently a big initiative on driving out entrapment in machinery events, um, companies should have an integrated communication procedure using toolbox talks and notices on notice boards and mentioned in publications in a carefully integrated manner. Of course, the bigger companies have professional people who can help with that. But even smaller one-site companies can use things in a, a carefully planned way. So our communication indicators, the actual number of safety-related communication events, such as toolbox talks, that each person attends in the year, and I do emphasize each person, um, it's very easy to think that you're communicating well because you're getting response from perhaps two or three people in a team. Um, but there could be people who are switched off and maybe even need excuses not to be there. So you need a list of people's names and you need to make sure that they get the, the communication at some point. 
Uh, you can count the regularity of safety committee meetings. And of course, you can log and time the dealing of issues and the time it takes to communicate the outcome back. And we have a, a survey statement here. I'm kept well informed about matters that may affect safety or health. And I am confident that issues I mention will receive attention uh, related, uh, rated on the one to 10 scale on our survey. And there's a section in the ISO standard on communication. Occupational health, a huge area in itself, but we felt that we ought to uh, include it. There's a lot of very professional people who know about this in great, much greater depth than us. But um, effectively, we thought that if we're talking about leading indicators, the most scientifically proven leading indicators are in health because a massive amount of research goes into that and it's possible to do epidemiological studies and so forth. And there are legal prescriptions that have emerged. They are a consensus. These eight hour time related averages on things like dust exposure and noise. Um, obviously the ideal is not to be there in the first place, but we have to get the job done. So it's a consensus of the practical against the ideal, but there is the hierarchy of risk control. So health surveillance should always be provided and in certain circumstances, such as people who work in silica sand quarries more frequently than others. So it's risk assessed. These days, we don't just have people back to work after um, a time off work and, and say, OK, Jim, good to see you back. There's the vehicle over there. Get on with it. We have a meeting to think about, uh, well, how can we help you? What does the doctor say? Is there anything we can do to make sure that you can get properly integrated back into your work and, and is there any support we can give. Stress and mental health, uh, it's a, a one-off mention here of mental health, but it is a, a growing area of concern in the health and safety environment. Um, so training of supervisors for that is uh, an important area. So our indicators, basically we've taken uh, the existing workforce exposure limits and said, ensure that you have regular measurements of these the dust measurement, measuring kit on people and noise measuring. And that you, you're showing that you're within the prescribed workforce exposure limits. Um, you can measure the, the percentage of supervisors that have had training in recognizing stress or other mental conditions. And don't assume that this is a management thing. Often you see managers talking about stress as a management area. Um, anybody can bring in a, 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 an issue from home or some people have greater tendency towards stress than others. Um, anybody can uh, suffer from stress. The schedules of health surveillance ensure that they're up to date and right. That's a measurable. And then ensure that health is included in your audits. The next one, another big area and often contentious, managing contractors. So really what we're saying here is that health and safety standards should be the same for your contractors as they are for your direct employees. That health and safety should be part of the selection of contractors just as much as cost and quality. And when you're reviewing your approved contractors list, ensure that um, health and safety is up there with, or in fact, perhaps even above cost and quality of performance. Um, so there are some things that our people came up with about confirming that there are the risk assessments and method statements. Don't just assume because the supervisor has come in with a, a smart briefcase full of well-ordered documents that that's going to be relevant for your site. It needs to be started from scratch and risk assessed. That there are equipment checks at the start of the day, just as your people would. There's good permit to work and hand over and that you're confident that these people have the training that they say they have. And there's always a bit of contention around things like safety passports, but that you are confident to your satisfaction. Are you treating contract people as you're treating employees, including them in any toolbox talks and other essential communication that comes down? Do management walking the job consider contractors as well? If they see a contract electrician working somewhere, will they engage them? And do they use your same near miss and hazard reporting process when they're on your site? Very often they can give a fresh pair of eyes. No doubt your people will report things that involve them. So they may well give you useful reporting on yours. And are they treated as partners when planning changes? Uh, and of course, if you track 
um, your health and safety events for contract people to the same level as employees, keep them separate. So um, your indicator is then the percentage of initial contractors which have review of safety standards alongside as cost and quality and at contract review and keep your contract related incidents separate so you can tell if any particular contractor is showing more or indeed less um, safety related incidents. You could even have a recognition event there. So there's a section in the ISO standard on contractors that fits very well with this. Root cause analysis. How do you have a proprietary effective method for training people in looking for root cause analysis? I'm a great believer in the fishbone or Ishikawa diagram, but there are um, bow tie diagrams. There's other methods that people use basically to get back from the obvious and start looking back into the training. People have had the communication, all the different areas that have gone on. Are all significant incidents um, investigated? And does it go back into these potential causes behind the actual event? And is there then an open and honest approach to identifying and communicating the recommended improvements? So our root cause indicators, um, monitoring incidents well for potential for harm and the number that you're investigating in depth and then the time scales it takes for coming back with improvement actions. And this relates well to a section in the ISO standard on incident nonconformity and corrective action. And risk assessment and control. So everybody has risk assessment. It's been legal for so long, or legal requirement that no doubt you'll be able to prove if there's an event that something's been done. But how effective is it? How current is it? Is it visible and how aware is it to everybody? Something I like to do is if I arrive at a site and the first opportunity I get to talk to somebody, tell me about risk assessment in, in your work. And very often you find that they will hum and haw and then come up with something that perhaps there was a one-off job and they're out on a whole road, a bit of work on buns or something. And the, yeah, the supervisor got us together. We had a look where the power lines were, where everything was and, and what the hazards were. But then you ask them, well, what about the job you do day to day? And they have more trouble in, in finding it and getting it out. Oh, I have to talk to the supervisor. They have something somewhere. So basically, do you involve employees? Do you review these risk assessments and, and assess things again uh, frequently and, and give appropriate training in the use of your, uh, you probably will have a little matrix or something with um, impact and frequency. Are people involved in that? And is every employee and contractor made fully aware of hazards, risk and safe procedure, even when moving around the site to different working areas? And ongoing site design. Sites are designed, no doubt, well at the start, but of course, faces move, hall roads move, um, stockpiles and waste tips move. And uh, you, you need to be constantly reviewing how site design works and how easy is it for people to follow safe procedure? For instance, locking off a conveyor. Is that something they can do relatively easy before they work on it? Does health have an equal emphasis in your risk assessments? And is, what is your schedule of existing re risk assessment review? So I used to say a maximum of three years until I was taken to task by actually a member of the workforce who was admittedly a safety rep, but he said, well, we do it every two years. So I thought, well, actually two years is a very long time. So maximum of two years. And does any change automatically trigger a review, a review of risk assessment? And do you have a, 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 an easy to use procedure for one off jobs such as the stop and think procedure? So indicators then, do you have a program of review of existing risk assessments? What is the frequency of involvement of every employee? And again, have a list of names and ensure that everybody has been tick, tick off that they have been reviewing the, the risks in their work. And audits on one off jobs to assure that all of those are effectively assessed. So we have an employee perception statement here in our little survey as well. The company ensures that I have thought carefully about the hazards in my work and how to minimize any risk to myself and others. If you took the first phrase off there, the company ensures, everybody would probably say, yeah, yeah, I've done so. But it actually brings the thought 
but actually have they been involved in something formal for their employer? And there's a whole section in the ISO standard on this as well, this fits well with. Recognition, back to the perhaps a happier sort of area to think about. So recognition is a, it's a powerful thing, positive recognition, uh, but it's very easy to be seen to be giving more criticism rather than praising good work. So you need to actually have a specific effort for this uh, and, and objectives to make that effort. Um, so recognition, the reasons must be clearly stated. Uh, it must be clear what you're recognizing. And um, sometimes there may be things worthy of formal recognition, perhaps once or twice a year, uh, photographs in the uh, local newsletter. Um, and that, uh, that has to be treated with care as well, of course, because it's easy to uh, recognize one team and put another team's nose out of joint because they feel it's just as good. So ensure that all recognition is worthy. And our indicators there is just that in the objectives for managers and supervisors, there is an expectation of positive recognition uh, and recognition actions per month at a personal level. Now, that needs to be uh, not just ticked off, but you probably need to keep a little note of what it was, just one liner, so that that can be tracked back and we get an impression of what's been going on when, when you're reviewing your performance. And then count the formal recognitions, for instance, in a year. The next one, back into the cultural area, uh, just culture. This was an interesting area. And we felt that with uh, a lot fewer people on sites and people pretty much uh, intensely uh, linked to their work day in, day out, um, it's very unlikely that an inappropriate action has been by choice. It would be probably very rare that somebody's left a job in a poor state or something. So effectively, we're saying that if something has not gone well, it's an error and therefore it's a lesson that can be learned. And we ask, do managers stand by decisions made by individuals, even if a problem should come up later? And we only have the one indicator here, and, and that's a question in our little survey. The management would support me if I made an honest decision that resulted later in an unexpected problem. That can be revealing. The only thing I found uh, related to this in the standard was about protecting workers from reprisals, which is perhaps a little bit uh, heavier. But uh, we do hear about bullying cultures, um, it, it, even in the UK. So uh, we need to think about that. Independent auditing. Most auditing within um, large companies is probably done by safety officers. So how independent they are when they, they are also responsible for a lot of the things that are there. But of course, they also want to check that they are there. Um, but they're usually very effective. Um, smaller companies will have a consultant coming in typically um, who, if they're good, will, will understand quarrying, but also bring in views from, from other industries, perhaps. Um, so, you know, we have the uh, actual legal to be controlled legally as far as is reasonably practicable. So there's a judgment being made. So once you've got the non-compliances in themselves should be a leading indicator of how documentation areas here, um, severity element there. And then the time to clear them. And it says, and that's based on what I've seen. I've been to two very similar sites, You're getting on with non-compliances and they've opened up a spreadsheet. Yeah, we've cleared these, look, see, there's one that needs a little bit of extra budget or something. Um, so hence 90% within four weeks. I've been to the other site and they pull out the report after a moment and then um, ask them about the non-compliances. They're having trouble actually showing me what situation is. So it, uh, it's, Attention to detail. A well-run site should be able to target themselves to that sort of time scale. And there's a section again to relate to the ISO standard. And then finally, we get to, well, what some people consider the, the ultimate one, the leadership. Now, we haven't gone very far into this. You can have, you know, long, lengthy, two-week or more leadership courses for managers these days often with a military input, often with a psychological input, leadership styles and so forth. Um, but we've just tried to look for relatively simple things that we can measure that um, will have an impact on our safety elements. So effectively at the senior end of the company, visibility, messages regularly put out across the organization and visits to sites. Nothing worse than the BMW glides into the car park 
the suit goes to the porter cabin to meet the manager a couple of hours later comes back out back to the car park and away make an effort to put on the kit to follow the walkways and go around looking for people to talk to and any senior manager of course you need to think about who that is regional manager somebody more senior occasionally um, and then the more the site managers and the supervisors on the sites obviously have to have a, a far greater component of time but they're under pressure to produce things on computers and now the phones follow them around and that can in fact become a crutch for people being uh, in the office with the computer so people need to have targeted time hours every day communicating with their people and seeking out what they're doing well recognizing it and um, obviously bringing to the attention anything that isn't so good workforce reps have an important leadership role and indeed everybody is in a sense a leader now so some of the things our people came up with for people to ask themselves have i actively engaged have i when i've been on this site have i been talking to people and how have i been coming across and am i reinforcing the good and not just looking for things to criticize and have I agreed anything and will I be sure to follow it up? Showing interest. So our indicators are improvement objectives in place and effectively reviewed, down cascading through the company from the top down and integrated. And that's in health and safety. And then messages giving out at least perhaps three or four a year, uh, planned in advance. Otherwise, it's very easy for these things to slip. And senior managers have targets that are diaried in their busy schedules to go to site visits and, and to spend time promoting safe working, communicating with the people, showing that they are human. And then local managers and local supervisors actually have hours, effective walking the job time. Their, their job is not entirely producing statistics. It is communicating and being there for their people. And then, of course, you can have planned focus. This is something measurable on specific safety aspects. And of course, the current initiative on entrapment of machinery would be one example of those. <clears throat> and we, we split our uh, survey statement in two here. We, we felt it was important that senior company managers believing in the importance of excellent health and safety and local managers believing in it. Uh, and uh, our smaller companies uh, felt that perhaps you might change the wording to something like company partners uh, from senior managers. And there's a whole section on leadership in the standard. So that's the 12 areas. Um, the little survey, this is just to prove that it will go on a one sheet of A4. So you can visualize giving it out to people at the end of a team meeting or before they go out in the morning. Uh, can you just... Um, uh, rate these things guys um, 10 is good and uh, one is bad and write it in between one to ten and then put it in the box over there before you go out don't have to put your name on it if you want to put something more write it on the back and it's fairly easy to count and you can get these surveys and of course you can then repeat it fairly easily and see if you're moving in the right direction if you're taking the average responses that's important but do also look at the spread you can have several eights and nines and then the odd one or two or three and it's important to know if somebody out there has seen something that they're not totally happy with uh, and then it's a, a useful thing is to use your safety reps to do a little bit of underlying investigation, uh, non-attributable to find out what might have caused those things. Now, this, this diagram comes from our document, our guidance document, which I'll, I'll tell you about again in a minute. Um, and it's effectively a process for you. We have considered the guidance. There's the 12 areas that I've just been through. Um, get together a little group of supervisors and workforce people, maybe run the, the survey with some samples and then get under the skin of this i know some of you are thinking well we've got all these things already there may have been uh, smaller companies in particular that might have, have seen things that need introducing but even if they're all there how well are they really working does this need revitalizing re addressing so look for things that are working well as well as just things that need improving and then think how are we going to know how well these are doing so set your indicators and then monitor and improve 
and then repeat the process. And I could have made this into one of those circular repeating diagrams, but um, it just made it more difficult to read. So there it is. Um, I'll just make a quick mention of this. It's the safety and health vision for the quarrying industry, and it's now 10 years old. Uh, it was launched at Hillhead in 2008. And if it reminds you a bit of the leading indicators I've been talking about, that's because it was based at the time on some thinking about leading indicators. But it's, it's, a lot of it is there and it still is current. Visible commitment by senior managers frequently demonstrated in word and deed, involving employees in controlling risks, communications in all directions, competence, continuous improvement and occupational health. And my last slide, just to say that we do have all this in a, a very easy to read, but well considered document, the guidance on leading indicators. Now I'd like to be able to give you a quick link to this, but unfortunately the QNJC website would mean the way it's set up that I'd have to give all these titles in one long link. So best to go to it with a computer rather than a, a smartphone with the app because you won't get the PDF on that. Um, so you go to very easily go to QNJC guidance because that's the main fo fo focus of the website leadership and workforce engagement and probably at the bottom of the list still because it's recent issue leading indicators and then within that this is all written out it goes page by page to guidance but probably the best thing is to go to the overview page and at the base of that you can download a pdf which will give you all our guidance uh, well prepared uh, and then you can read it at your leisure and it is of course now official guidance issued by the industry and the HSE is uh, part of the QNJAC so they know it's there and so it could always uh, come up in discussions if you do have an incident be aware of that um, so thank you for your time and I hope that this has been useful and please do go back and readdress the things that you're doing and see if there are anything that could be revitalized renewed and reviewed Thank you very much and good luck.